and like proper real software services of, I don't know, serving images for all of our sites all around the world, uh, handling authentication and, and stuff like that. And that's our reaction. That's us after the meeting. Like, like this is exciting. This is the best thing ever for engineers. Because like we love it, we love to build things, right? Uh, before we had some legacy stuff to basically handle, some edge cases to maintain, like some some teams to consult, and that was all fun. But it wasn't building new shiny things. And you know, what's not cool about this? This is easy. This is fast. This is refreshing, and surely we'll have a great time doing it. Yeah. Obviously, the whole thing is a kind of a bag of snakes if you don't know how to approach it. And I just want to walk you through uh, what things helped us on the way. Mostly basic stuff, because really, it's usually about basics. Uh, we usually struggle to get them right in the first place. And, and once we don't, then it kind of shapes our path in a totally wrong direction. So, hey, my name is Wojciech. I work for uh, OLX. Uh, Wojciech as in voice check. Uh, I wore a few different hats in the last uh, few years from software to release engineering, from operations to leading tech teams, from DevOps engineering, I have no idea what that is still, uh, to basically uh, overlooking uh, two services right now, two of the four we had on the previous slides. And mostly, I focus on uh, balancing between building and breaking things, usually in the web, usually at scale. Uh, I work for OLX for around three years now. Uh, we're a classified platform. If you want to you know, sell a phone, buy a car, rent an apartment, give something away for free, uh, you probably want to check us out. The one thing that you probably need to know uh, regarding the context of this talk is that we work at scale. Not crazy scale, we're not Facebook, but it's not small like, as well. We have 50 markets right now. Uh, 25 offices around the world, around 3,000 people at OLX, and, and on like the web tech stack, we serve around 50 billion page views monthly. Probably this is very much outdated. You can probably double it or triple it. Um, and yeah, for the, for the meeting we had, for the pivot we had, for, for the change of our team that we have, this means our clients are remote, they are around the world, and there's plenty of them. So, yeah, um, that's pretty much where we get to the panic attack phase, right? Uh, we start to realize what's the scale, what's the complexity, and the kind of the can't fuck this up factor because this is part of the global strategy. We're part of a bigger ecosystem. Like, if we fail, someone else fails. Like, you don't only really want to have this, right? So, but as a package, we kind of, as a package deal of, of, of becoming this, this team, uh, we got a lot of freedom. So we got to make all the decisions, right? And that kind of puts us in the risk of, of taking all the wrong turns and, and making all the possible mistakes. So let's first start off what can possibly go wrong in this, in this situation. And you probably have heard of this book, People Were. Uh, it's a study of what makes uh, teams and projects successful and what makes them a total failure. Uh, what they found out is that basically all the failures are not technological. Like, it's never the tech that's the problem. It's never the problem that's too hard uh, for the team. So if it's not tech, what can it possibly be? And turns out, surprise, surprise, all the problems are usually sociological in nature. Right? That means us, engineers and managers, developers and operators, from decision making to communication, like we're the biggest risk factor, the teams, the people, all of us. And you've probably heard this thousand times, that culture eats strategy for breakfast, and, 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 and this is because it's true. Uh, so we can try to plan for speed and, and, and quality and agility, and, and but that requires to get to those things. That requires to have all your teams and everyone in your company and organization at the same page, and you never get to that by following a plan. You need to have people that will make decisions and not wait for a good to go from the manager or a central unit or whatever else. So you need an environment that enables the teams and a culture of empowerment, basically. An example can be Facebook's move fast and break things. That's a culture thing. That's a, that's a culture uh, direction. 
and that's all cool, but like, except you can't break things. Come on, <laughs> what were you thinking? Like, not even Facebook's doing that. They're doing stable infra passing tests and fixing things because they're running a business after all. Like, so do we, right? So, a good example of a culture thing, just not something we can possibly do. Remember, we can't fuck this up. Um, so, I really like something I've learned from a colleague recently. Uh, and it's the uh, jobs to be done theory, and it goes something like this. Everything you spend time or money on is a product. And you hire this product to do a certain job for you. As an example, this is something that every engineer will tell you when you tell him he's free to innovate, right? And obviously this is absurd, because we all know Golang would be better to go with. Uh, but yeah, Scala in this, in this example is something that you hire. You hire, you, you put money or resources or your time as a team or individual to learn Scala. So Scala is basically doing a job for you. And it might make, make sense, like, like maybe the job is that your software will scale better, right? The page uh, loads will be faster. Uh, maybe your team has experience in Scala, therefore like, you have a long-term benefit of, of, of moving faster with this language. Those are all good reasons, but what are not good reasons? Trends, fashion, and, and, and hacker news. Like, if there's a real use case behind using Scala, if there's a real job to, to be solved, to be done by Scala, that's all good. If you just learned on hacker news there's this cool new language or a framework or a library, that's probably bad. And I completely agree with the, the above uh, quote. I would even say that 90% is an understatement. Uh, tech is really driven by, 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 by fashion and by, by, by trends, not by what can we get out of it. And that's actually our head of product, the same, the same person that introduced me to the jobs to be done theory. And he's like, you know, innovation is not only about new bells and whistles or moving to Scala, it's also about improving what you already have. And I would even say it's not also what you already have, it's mostly what you already have. So, you know, what do we do here? And I'm pretty sure it has something to do with business, right? People that pay us money, like, like, like the customers that, that drive uh, our success, and with the product. So, I remember the first time I was, I was in operations for a while. I, I, I switched from engineering, from, from software development to, to operations, to like hardcore sysadmin stuff. So I was reading a few books on the topic. And what it hit me the first time I've read in one of those books that the job of IT operations is not caring for the servers or deployments or uptime, it's enabling the business, that's it. Whatever the business needs to be enabled to move faster. And you rarely think about sysadmins and Linux kernel changes and IP tables as, as, as like in this context. Uh, and that's shocking at first, but once it sinks in, once you really realize what it's about, it's shocking to think otherwise. And so what do we bring to the table? What's our value added? Uh, we building the image service, for example. Uh, we optimize the site speed, right? That drives the user engagement. Uh, we work to improve the customer experience. That also has an impact on our metrics, on our business metrics. Uh, we allow other teams to move faster because we, we, we take something from their plate. We do it really good. And they have more time to, to tackle local product uh, challenges. They don't have to think about serving images, something totally outside of their core business. But we're not building Scala microservices. This is not what we should do. This might be some kind of a tool or, 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 or a stepping stone, but totally not the core of our existence. And once you know, you know what the job is, what the job are you hired to do, right? It's easier for you to come up with all the jobs that you need to hire some products for. And there's a few things I want to talk in regards to. So what the first thing is basically sanity in that situation, because like, you're jumping into a stressful situation and there's a lot of new things. So it's good to retain sanity. So what products do you hire to stay sane, right? Uh, and it turns out, like everything else, it's about the basics. Your team is uh, 
is way better at moving fast. It's way better at engineering things than you might think or than you like to think. Uh, because engineers, from my experience, personally, they do quality work by default. And by the way, whenever I'm saying engineers, I'm not, saying, I'm not talking about some kind of an, my team or, or, or people that report to me. I'm also an engineer. I'm, I'm just, I just happen to be accountable for a given service, but I, I sit with them and we code together. So engineers do quality work by default. And, and, and all we have to do is to not mess this up, to remove the obstacles that might you know, uh, impact what we should be doing. And that's usually non-core things non-core non stuff, things that are not important to achieving the goal. If you need to follow an eight-point plan to release or, or do manual testing and QA, like get distracted with all those things, be like in 1990s again, that's, that's never going to happen. It won't lead anywhere. Um, and context switch is expensive. Like if you, if you get distracted with all those things, it adds up a lot. And it's frustrating yourself, it's frustrating your team. And, you know, Abusive process gets abused. If you require an eight-point plan to release, uh, then probably eventually people will start to put in changes and just not telling you about it because it's going to go well and eventually it's going to blow up some, somehow. And the, thing, the best thing about the context, which is mostly redundant, at least, at least the big chunk of it, like the 80% can be just basically automated away. So. What we found out is useful for us is automate stuff and build tools that can help us daily. And there's a couple of things that we did. Your mileage may vary, depends very much on the context. For us, it was those things. From Slack bots and Slack deployments to even automating Jira ticketing, so we don't move the tickets. Uh, they are being moved for us when we release or deploy or go to staging or go to production. We do track development, we don't do branches, we do CD. Uh, we have a nice platform that basically means Kubernetes is just, a, just one, of the, one of the parts of it, but uh, it's done in a way where if you worked with one application, you know how to work with all the others. Everything is the same, monitoring, logging, uh, the way you configure things. And obviously, all the usual silver bullets of Docker Cloud and Synergy, that's in there as well. And I asked the team, I, I did a survey after six months of, 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 of making all those changes. Uh, I asked a few things, like how do they like where we are? And you know, what do you think about the platform uh, that we created? Uh, and, and those are the results. So I would say pretty good. As long as there's nothing on the negative side, I would say this is, this is, this is quite, quite fine. Because we're also talking to people that don't really care about what is Kubernetes, or is it better than Mesos? They care about the outcome, whether or not it helps them daily. That's how they judge it. Uh, what do you think about the Slack bots? That was, that was super, super, super useful to the team, for, for everyone. Uh, one thing we did also is we went with Java, even though we were not really a Java shop before. We were doing PHP and Python and Ruby, and, and, and we had some experience in Java and, and some professional engineers, but not everyone was on board. Surprisingly very good for a language discussion with, between engineers. This is amazing. Like you would expect at least one person to say no one because Golang is not here. Uh, this looks like the most negative feedback we got, but I think this is this is the best one. Uh, long story short, and point being, computers are great at doing things, so make them do things, and you know, use humans to drink with or or, or solve core problems to your company. I really like this 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 quote from Zach Holman. And just a word on planning, just like an intersection. Uh, you know, we're super aware of the business, and, 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 but we're still engineers. I'm still an engineer. And, 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 and there's still, this will not go away. <laughs> those, those will probably, like, the first thing we're going to do, like, when we try to design a service, we're going to still start with, oh, maybe this is time for Golang now. Those things have purpose, and they all solve problems. They solve different problems, and we just have to know where's their place and not abuse that and not spend lots of time on endless and pointless conversations because we're engineers. That's just going to make us have a bad time. Uh, yeah, that's it. And I also want to insert a quick rant here, something that's very close to my heart. Uh, Obviously about DevOps. So 
because we can't have a discussion around the culture if we don't talk about DevOps a bit. This is, this is the one of the most important cultural things, changes and, and influences, influencers uh, these days. And you probably want to start with like, what is DevOps? So I was interviewing a lot lately, trying to hire my team. And, and, and I, I usually like to add, like, ask, this, like, ask this question. And I'm getting weird answers. And I'm, and I'm getting, like, I'm asking 10 people for, you know, what is DevOps? And I get like 15 different contradicting answers. Uh, so I asked my team, because like, like, who can I ask better than my team? And my team said this, basically. I think this also includes my answer. So one of the green ones is mine, so that doesn't count. And they said those things uh, to people in my team that I was evangelizing that daily and screaming it in the workplace and, and like in the open space that it's a way of working and people working together. We still have like two people saying it's CI and automation or, or infra and ops synonym and one person claiming it's a sandwich. I hope it's a mistake. Uh, but it's not that. It's not a sandwich, and it's not CI, and, and it's not about infrastructure operations. It's, it's about making what you do everyone's job and about working together as a team. That's it, about, about caring. And not just between devs and ops. It's, it's QA, security, it's product, like engineers caring about product and product caring about engineering cycles and issues and problems and refactors. This is, being, like, this is implementing DevOps, right? If you can't work together, you will be slower if you don't understand like, like what you're dealing with uh, or what your teammates are dealing with from, from a different uh, perspective. Like, like you can never move fast and you can, you can never do it properly, right? It's also about, about the trust, right? It's not possible without trust. And, and you can't expect you know, developers to, to, to work great if they don't have access to tooling on the operations side. Operators probably work way better if they can, ask, can have access to, to the code base, maybe change it a bit, may, maybe you know, add some stuff that optimize some queries. I don't know. Like, we do this. It's fine. It works. Like, none of the developers dropped a database in production. This doesn't happen daily. Sorry, GitLab. It doesn't. Once in a while, maybe. Uh, and then often you'll get like, yeah, but we're not Netflix. What do we do? Like those, they, they have the culture, they have the people, they hired the best. And, and no, not really. Like they hired people. They didn't engineer a special breed of humans for, for that are capable of doing chaos monkeys and DevOps in production and put developers on call. They hired them from Microsoft and Sun when they were not trendy and edgy yet. It's culture that enabled those people. It's, it's, it's what Netflix did. It's what Netflix built when it comes to culture, enabling each and one of them to, to, to make things better. And you don't have to, like, you can start small. Like, don't put your developers on call. This will, this will probably cause outages and scare the shit out of them and then make you not sleep at night as an operations person. Like, do simple things. Start talking to each other. Like, like, like work together, implement your, your devs and ops. Like, like, put them in a single space. Uh, maybe start doing packs, like cross-functional packs. Like, we did that, it really works for us. Our developers are not on call, but they are aware of the ops changes, and, and they, can, they can deploy and add applications to the platform. Uh, our, our, our ops know about the changes happening in the application, and they are somehow working very closely with respective teammates from development, right? And we do post-mortems together, like share what went wrong. Because it's never developers' fault and their code, and it's never operators and their servers. It's somewhere in the middle, right? So, you know, why bother? And this is, this is not me saying, like, picking rainbows and saying unicorns uh, or, 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 you know, everything is fine and great. Like, we also have problems. We actually have a single person in our team saying, like, we don't actually DevOps, right? The other, the other eight are saying, yeah, it's fine, we do good. But there's still work to be done. So I'm not just saying, you know, do this because it's great. It worked for us. There's, you know, it's a process. We're getting there. Everyone can get there. Um, yeah. Next thing I want to talk about is focus. And while sanity helps us to, to avoid some distractions, like, it won't take us all the way. It doesn't give us the context, the context that we need to go from, from A to B, right? This is the ideal situation when we want to achieve a goal. And like, often it's not ideal, it's not perfect. We, we kind of lose the track, then we get back on tracks, and this is actually not terrible, as long as we avoid this, of like not hitting the wall. Uh, 
you can be excelling at what you're doing. If you're doing the wrong thing, it will take you nowhere, right? This can be Scala microservices or, or, or Rust data pipelines. It's, it's cool. If they don't do the job, it's, it's worthless. So what do we use and what we learned about, about keeping an eye on the ball and, 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 and being focused, right? Uh, what do we use, what do we hire to do the job of distinguishing between important and urgent? Because if something's urgent, it doesn't mean you have to drop everything and tackle it. Because just because someone's screaming somewhere in the corner doesn't really mean you should be doing this. So we use OKRs. Uh, show hands if you know OKRs. Okay. And show hands if you use OKRs. Excellent. So not that many people, it's good. Uh, so basically, it stands for objectives and key results. Uh, and it's a very simple framework. We use it to, to, to kind of gain focus. It goes like that. You set an objective for yourself. It's an objective for the next three months. You set it quarterly. It doesn't have to be super precise. It has to be inspirational. It has to be something you can print or, or a banner or a t-shirt, tattoo on your skin if you're very much into like, your, what your company is doing. Uh, and that's going to drive you for the next three months, for the next quarter. Then the next thing you do is you say, what are the key results? What are the measurements of this objective? How do we know at the end of the quarter we've met the goal or not? So I want to destroy the rebellion. I say, you know, I don't want to have Luke Skywalker anymore around. And maybe the Death Star is operational and working and in production. Uh, three things tops. Don't, don't get distracted. Just three things. That's, that's enough for, for a two pizza team, basically. Um, and then you add a health metric, which is something you, you track, basically, you look at, at, at your metrics. If this goes wrong, then you have an excuse to, to tackle urgent and important things outside of your objective. And then you set priorities. Priority one and priority two. And you do it every week based on the objective and the key results. You set priorities for the week, which then you take and split down into tasks for, for the week. You do Kanban, whatever you do, doesn't matter. Uh, it's a function of the priorities you say uh, you do. Probably you don't want to have more than two priority ones because those are the ones that if you don't meet the goal, you're done. Like something, something's really, really bad. And then the priority twos are, are the things you just want to do. You feel this is important. And at the end of the week, you celebrate. You look at your Kanban board. You either met those priorities or not. You have a beer. You have two beers. Doesn't matter. The, my team says this is super cool. For me personally, this is, this is the best thing since sliced bread. I've never been as focused. I've never had so clear vision of, of what do you want to achieve as a team and as a product and all those things. So I, if you don't know OKRs, you, you probably want to take a look into that. Uh, those are engineers. Like, there's not a single product person uh, that was surveyed for this. This is software engineers, senior software engineers, and operations engineers. This is a very tough crowd to, to get a survey on a process and get those results. And the last thing I want to talk about is ownership. And so I became a father recently. And that means for me, I learned a few things, a few new things for me. For example, I, I, I learned what parents do when they hear a baby crying somewhere in the room. Uh, they shrug. They do nothing. <laughs> it's not their baby. They don't care, right? And we see this at the office every day somehow, or, or we used to see this at the office every day, or, or, or we just know that this can happen. Like, we can relate, right? The site is slow. Whose job is that? Uh, we have non-optimal queries somewhere. Whose job is that? I don't care, not my baby. Looking into caching, dumping TCP or whatever, sometimes you'll have this, 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 this one very motivated employee, but most of the time maybe you won't. And, and who's going to fix that? And, and how this will scale and, 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 and actually work long term? So how do you make it you know, the other way around? How do you, how do you, how do you flip that? Uh, how do you make sure like, there's ownership of things that, 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 as a part of the culture, people pick up things that are broken? As a company, we've, we've been things, and, and, and we've seen things as well, from like, having 50 markets, having 25 offices around the world, having tens of engineering teams, acquiring different companies or whatever. We've been through all the phases, from like, free-for-all, free and, and, and 
free approach. Like you can do as a team whatever you want. This is fast. Go this way, which basically means like you end up with a shit ton of reinvented wheels, legacy code bases that will bite you with the strength of 10,000 suns. <laughs> Uh, and they are far from being good, far from being best in class. Uh, and then the next phase we try to do is to exchange those services. Like, so why would I build, you know, the tenth wheel? Someone already did that. So I'm just gonna take this code and run it uh, in my company, in, in in my tech team. This might be, you know, uh, Java versus PHP or whatever. Like exchanging things between totally different backgrounds, cultural, technological, different stacks, time zones, tabs and spaces. Uh, it doesn't work, so we went to internal OSS, uh, internal open source. Also, didn't work because you still end up with with a lot of this and a lot of that because people just just can't relate. So we did what Jeff Bezos told Amazon to do a while ago. Uh, I don't know if you trust Jeff Bezos. You probably, maybe you should, maybe you shouldn't. Like like he's really good at business, so I do trust him a bit. He said. APIs or GTFO, like you either build services and you communicate over very strict formal protocols and there's no going around that, or you can leave the company like, here's the door. And turns out uh, that, was, that, was, that was a silver, one of the silver bullets, maybe, I don't know, something very important for Amazon. And we also learned the same way. This solves a lot of problems and gets a lot of jobs done because this means you have a team that's solely responsible for a service. They build it, they run it, they, they care for it. If something's broken, it's very, very clear what's broken. Uh, they have to document it in a way where other teams can use it, can consume the service or build a client for that. And it basically moving to this as a service model for us worked miracles. And we focus more, we were less confused, we're basically empowered, and we can also track what's our impact. And yeah, that's it. That's what I have. It works for us. And thank you so much. Sorry for running thank over time. Thank you, No, you're perfectly on time. Um, one question. OK. There are a couple of questions, but one I'm really interested in as well. You had a lot of languages in use. Yeah. You decided to use Java. Yeah. How did you approach the kind of like switching? How does it work? So for us, it was, it was fairly simple uh, because we were a framework team. So we were, we were working on a PHP framework that was used in different companies around the world. We just handed over that. And we were starting from scratch. Oh, that's the easy Ideal one. Ideal situation, <laughs> yeah. That's uh, perfect, oh, but isn't we, it? But we only had a few professional, prof, like proficient Java engineers. So for the rest of the team, that meant catching up. But that's also why we went with Java, because we had those people in the first place we can share knowledge with. If that wouldn't be the case, probably we would be doing Golang these days. So, cool. Thank you very much, Roger. Thank you.